my name is Suryansh Tubriwal, and today I'm going to talk about why MVP is never just an MVP. So first of all, a show of hands, who of you are on Twitter? Anyone on Twitter? Follow me, please. <laughs> okay, so just a little background about myself. I am a backend developer at Booking.com in the new product development department. I, I have experience developing like different kind of MVPs for different experimental products that we keep trying and working at startups before. I really like uh, trying out new ideas, seeing how users behave on them, and following the new tech trends. Uh, to just get an idea of the crowd, how many of you have worked on new product development? Like creating products from scratch? How many of you have your own side projects, trying out different things? Nice, nice mix. Cool. So what is an MVP? An MVP is basically, in full form, minimum viable product, which is meant to test out an idea. In, in product development practices, we call it like, okay, if I want to validate whether users will like this or not, what is the minimum set of features that I can create to validate this out? We have all been there. We get into a new team, we are working on a new product, and uh, the product manager comes up with a list of features that, okay, let's build this. Then we come up with the whole architecture to design, like, okay, we can have this data management system, we can have these set of services who will interact like this, and these can be the particular set of clients that we'll support. But then the manager says, okay, we need to get it out in three months. <laughs> so now we're like, okay, we can uh, decrease the test coverage. We can prioritize these features for now. We can start with one service. Now, we basically start cutting corners, thinking that, OK, it's just MVP right now. And when it's successful, we'll, we'll see what to do. What happens ultimately is when it becomes successful, you never have time to go back and change things. So that's the reality of MVP that uh, it, it never works, but when it works, you want it to work very well. So that's what I mean when I say you might just end up scaling it. So a, a big problem that happens when we are starting working on a new product is choosing the right stack. We end up picking up something which maybe is preferable to us, or sometimes we pick up something which is totally suitable for this problem, but has not been used in market before. Just to give an example from my company, there is a legend at Booking.com that, don't quote me on this, 20 years ago, uh, one of the founders just walked into a bookstore and found the book starting with Pearl. And he was like, okay, this seems interesting. He picked it up, he, he quoted Booking.com, Booking.com became a runaway success, and now 1,500 developers are writing Perl code because someone decided to pick up the Perl book. <laughs> so choose the right stack. Generally, in a set of team, when you have backend developers and client-side developers, and you start making a, survey, uh, a product for one particular client, what ends up ha happening is that the backend is like, totally made around that client. So for example, if you have this front end, which supports some particular features based on the current design, then the backend APIs start with time morphing to that particular client, which ends up creating problem for future. Because what if your client changes? What if the front end does not work the way you want? Then you basically have an API, which totally works for that, but is not very flexible to use for other things. So a caveat to follow in these kind of things is to, to think of backend as a API service of what use cases it's gonna solve. Make the APIs around that, and then client will make the changes to support those kind of front backend queries. The microservices are the new thing right now. Everyone wants to create a service for everything. Suppose I'm creating a platform which has a content management solution, which has a distribution API for other servers to use, and 
which has uh, an API for the front-end client that we are going to use now. Now, suppose you're time boxing for three months to launch a product, and you have three services to maintain. Getting into the battle of creating microservice for each purpose is, is going to add a lot of dev time and infrastructure time, which is never accounted for. So my, my idea around this is generally like to start with one service and then make the service, in, uh, make the functionalities uh, modules so that they can interact with each other in a way that if you want to separate them into service later, it's much more easier to do that. This, this helps us in not setting in extra infrastructure for each service, not setting up more monitoring and alerts for each service. I have a funny story to tell. So I was working on a product around transportation, and uh, we launched in a city, and we, uh, it was basically airport transfer to begin with. Now, we launched at Amsterdam, and Amsterdam only has one major airport. So while developing the platform, the assumption was made that the city will have one airport because we just didn't care about that at that point. Now, of course, this is not going to scale. So choosing the right entity relationships is something which is very, very important. And is, it does not add a lot of extra dev time. It does not create problems in like writing a tons, tons of extra code or in scaling. But if you do the right assumptions at the start, it helps a lot in the future. Then you don't end up writing exception cases for multi-airports later. When we start, we see that, okay, this bug is happening and only one user is hitting on it. We're like, okay, only two users, one user is affected. We can just ignore that for now. But that happens because you have like 1,000 users at this point. What happens if you scale? If you get to 20,000 users, 50,000 users, 100,000 users, that one user getting affected becomes hundred, thousands, ten thousand. So that's why when you're starting, each bug is a bug worth solving. Creating MVP is not easy. You are time boxed, you have multiple issues to solve, you have things to ship out, you are bound to do things which are not gonna scale. Like to give an example, we were using a third party API to get these search results for airport transfer, let's say. That API was in a beta version at that point, and it used to take like three seconds to respond sometimes. Now, three seconds on a real-time application does not really cut the job. So we created a caching script to, to cache the results that we need for search results and decided to absorb the diff which will exist in the real price and the price that we are caching based on real time. Now, this is not gonna scale, of course, but that is what we needed at that point. So in these cases, it's important to set the expectations right with the team that, okay, this is the limit. This is gonna work till five cities, but it's not gonna scale after that. So, so let's make sure we account for that. Follow the 80-20 rule. That, that applies to everything in life. Just think that, okay, these are the features which are gonna make a difference to me. These are the services which are gonna last in future, and these are the services which, are just, which I'm just creating right now. Focus on the services which, which you think will be required in the future and cut corners in, in the other services. Creating MVPs. 98% of times it does not work. Most of the times you're gonna just throw away your solution in the end or just decide that, okay, this was not the right way to do and let's try it this way. So don't fall in love with your code. Just be ready to make the change when it's required to. Working at a global company, that's something that I learned as a lesson since day one. Anything that you make is gonna be supported by 30 languages in the world. Anything that you develop is gonna be launched in 100 countries. So even if you're starting with one, suppose you start launching in Slovakia and you think that, okay, let's just check the airport code for Slovakia or the city code for this, and you hard code these kind of things in the code. These kind of things, like, when I'm talking right now, it might feel like, okay, nobody does that, but when you sit down to do it, a lot of people just end up doing that. So keeping configurations for these kind of things, like keeping entry in the databases for cities and just querying even for one to begin with, helps it 
make it adaptable to go global in future. Support languages. Always be ready to use things like copy tags. Don't, don't hard code text messages on the code so that in future it becomes easy to support much, many more languages to experiment with different copies and just be ready to scale for global. Uh, these are the caveats that I have observed till now. And now, the, now what I'm going to mention are components which we sure should account for while developing, which are not really features per se, but exist because you need that for an MVP. Feedback loops. The only reason we are creating an MVP is to see whether users like it or not. So if we want to test users like it or not, we cannot do that without having good feedback loops. Having feedback loops at the right places, collecting the data in the form that you can analyze and decide what to do next is very, very important. Behavioral data. A, a lot of times we don't account for like calculating click-through rate across your screens or uh, having analytics about demographics, which users are performing well, which users won't perform. Integrating with a simple Google Analytics might be a good first step, but it's important to keep in mind while launching an MVP. Monitoring and alerts. When we start, things are so low that you're not going to notice it by yourself. If you don't have the right monitoring and right alerts placed, if you don't have checks like, uh, okay, uh, we were getting average bookings like this per day, but not, we are not getting that anymore, it's going to be really hard to notice these things. So putting the right monitoring and alert seems like a good to have, but it's very, very important to launch an MVP. Now, you could, what's the point of doing MVP? The point of doing MVP is to validate the idea. So to validate the idea, to validate the product, maybe building the whole solution is not really required. So I'm gonna tell just some quick hacks that you can use to validate those MVPs. Fake door test. Fake door test is one of the most common ways used right now to validate an idea. Like uh, putting a banner on your website uh, saying if you would like to use this particular thing and if users click on it, you can say, okay, we are working on that right now. Basically create a fake door, but you get enough input to see that there are users interested in this. Using no code alternatives. No code alternatives like uh, sheet to site or, or Squarespace, all the platforms which just allow you, allows you to drag and drop, try these things out, see if users are interested in actually using this, and then go back to zero and start building it. Well, if it all fails ultimately, you can just always try again and start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's get to the questions. You can still ask the speaker um, through Slido. So let's get to the first one. How long should the MVP development last at max? So it's probably very individual, but <laughs> maybe from your experience. That's a very subjective question. But uh, from what I've seen, generally, first of all, it's very important to time box it. Whatever time you keep, just decide what you think is best, but time box it. Because if you don't time box it, if you don't put that date on the board, it's, it's never going to finish. Because there's always something more that you can develop. There's always something more that you can polish. So time box it. For me, three months have been a good time to time box it till now, but they can, it depends on how complicated your product is. And so could you tell us a little more on uh, what MVP, uh, if any, are you working on right now? Uh, and what did you need to prioritize, etc. cetera, some, some experience? Okay, so uh, the current MVP that we are working on right now is, has its own kind of challenges. So we are basically working with an acquisition that we have made recently and launching a new platform. So working with an acquisition, you need to make sure that you use the systems that they are using. So the platform is basically transport comparison where uh, we are going to compare all the transport methods which exist in a city and suggest you the right one. So in this case, it seems like an easy problem to solve, but there are various things that you need to prioritize. Like, first of all, if you want to choose between the right options, maybe uh, content becomes really important. 
So getting the right content at the scale that you want to is, is one thing. So just to elaborate on content, uh, we are going to launch in three cities for now, but in future we are going to be in like 100 cities, 200 cities. So right now we want the content to be really curated. So we have created our own database structure to support that content so that it can become a content service later. Storing that content in the right format, we are doing it manually right now because we want to see what kind of problems you are facing. When you're just starting, there's no point automating something which you don't know the right way to do. So just doing it manually for the first couple of cities might help us think of schemas later and maybe create our own CMS. Then the second thing is supporting external APIs that we're going to use on that. So I'll, as I said, it's an acquisition. So you need to see if the, the, those APIs support the features you need or not. So sometimes you just mock those features to start with. Then uh, third problems that we are facing and prioritizing is supporting the right language and currencies. We are s sitting in a different infrastructure than the rest of the company. So a lot of things are not uh, available to us out of the box. So we need to re reinvent the wheel in some of the things. So we prioritize that, okay, we are gonna launch in these three kind of cities. Let's see if we can only support this particular currencies to begin with. So, uh, thank you. So, um, another process question. Uh, so, how to set up a correct deadline, especially when you're trying to create a completely new product? So, I think we've addressed this uh, yeah, a little bit, of. but yeah. maybe, maybe uh, from from your experience, how did you? Uh, was it like a democratic uh, decision, or was it the decision of your manager or or yours? So, it's it's generally mixed. So, manager comes up with a business deadline, then developers say that okay, this is not practical. <laughs> <laughs> then. Then you just, first of all, try to brainstorm the features that you're going to build, how much time it's going to take for each feature to be built. You try to come up with a timeline. Then you add 20% extra to that timeline and say this is much it's going to take. Now, of course, it's going to be much more than what the product manager thought. So then you start cutting down on the features. So it's really difficult to predict, especially on a new product. Most of the times, everyone's guessing, and it kind of works most of the time. And do, do you have something like a quick start boilerplate plate project that you always start with, like some, uh, some uh, habit that you have at, at the start? Uh, depends a lot on which stack you are in. But uh, if you're creating a website on any kind of stack, you're going to most of the time need uh, databases. You're going to need, uh, need to schedule cron jobs. So the basic stack to start with, if suppose in Python, I really like Flask. So if I'm just creating a backend specific solution, I would set up a quick Flask server and uh, set up a basic uh, DB, DB schema, start with SQLite maybe, just to begin with, and uh, just use an Amazon EC2 instance to host and schedule cron jobs there. So, uh, what about a fail? So, uh, if, if uh, somebody wants to send an MVP uh, to, to Trash, uh, so how to, uh, have you ever had this kind of experience? I, and how did you communi communicate it to, the, to your managers or C-level? Mm. So, MVPs pivot all the time. So, there can be two reasons that you need to trash it. First, the product did not work out. So, anyways, you don't care about that product. In that case, you don't need to convince anyone. Second, you made something which you were just in a hurry and it does not really work on scale. So first you try to um, monkey patch it. You try to fix things in which works till a particular point. You try to get more put into more timelines. If that does not work, it's just better to just say, okay, this particular solutions are not gonna scale. We need to sit down and keep some time to make them uh, like this particular component again. Just, just be bold and stay it. So, next, next question: um, What pro processes would you recommend prioritizing and organizing work inside an MVP? What processes? So, uh, it depends on what you think as the first, the most important thing. So, if you are working 
like in the pure product and customer mindset, uh, which I generally like, it's it's important to think what features users care about. So don't think that okay. Uh, for example, if I, I worked on a project on Alexa, which was around conversational interfaces. So in conversation, in conversational interfaces, uh, the communications can get really complex. So you could use a proper state machine solution to manage all these kind of conversation and create the perfect product. Or if you just wanted to test out this idea in two weeks, you can just write quick if elses to validate the idea and then start building on a proper solution. So uh, I would say list down all the features that you need. Pick up, OK, these features are important. Prioritize it. And then think of what long-term services and solutions you want to provide. Then pick like the two most important services and focus on them. I'll elaborate a little on this. So how do you organize your work? Like, what's, what are your favorite, uh, favorite um, self-organizing methods uh, as a team? Uh, we all use Trello a lot. So on Trello, we, we generally like add, add our own tasks, add like a time box duration on it, add tags, whether it's back end, front end, what kind of support it's required. Add, uh, generally comment on them. And one important thing that we do as a team and we have realized with time is to shuffle, shuffle the tasks. So for example, I start working on a content management system. I did some part of it. Then instead of doing everything myself, switch some part of the task to another member of the team. Because especially in big corporates, people leave all the time. People switch teams. People uh, leave the company. So if you... Uh, keep the knowledge in one person, it becomes really difficult to adapt it later. So that's one thing that we keep in mind while allotting tasks in our sprints. And how many people are there now on your, uh, on your MVP team? Uh, depends on how much budget you can get for that. <laughs> uh, generally, we start with a small team, like two back end, one front end, a designer, a product manager, and sometimes a copywriter, which is used across the teams. So probably there is, uh, there is somebody who doesn't like Trello so much. So what, did, what do you think of you track? Uh, uh, generally, the battle is between Trello and Jira. I've not okay. really heard you track. Okay, can someone elaborate on that? So maybe you can uh, try. I, I feel Trello is really quick. It does not put a lot of processes, keeps you flexible. And I, as a developer, wouldn't like to write a lot of things there. So I like Trello. Yeah. So uh, if there are any more questions you can uh, ask uh, Suryansh um, offline and I would like to thank you very much for coming to Bratislava uh, for uh, talking about MVP and um, enjoy Slovakia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you.